Welcome. I'm Sarah Bartlett, Director of Writing Inside Vermont. This is the reading from Hear Me, See Me, Incarcerated Women Write. Thank you so much to Burlington Book Festival organizers Rick Kasanak and Kim McQueen for this opportunity, and to Mike DeSanto of Phoenix Books for suggesting it. Gracious thanks as well to our funders Barry and Peter Dreisigacker for program support, and to our fiscal agent Vermont Works for Women. And as a special welcome, Mary Beth Redmond has joined us today. She created with me both the book and the program it's based on. Writing Inside Vermont is offered exclusively at Vermont's single women's prison, Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility in South Burlington, Vermont. Weekly since 2010, our team of trained facilitators has established safe and structured space for women to explore and challenge life choices through writing, regardless of education or writing ability. In our work together, we create a community of trust in which women can uniquely be seen and heard for who they truly are. Here, their words are received without judgment, their stories held with compassion, their struggles met with support. Facilitators write alongside inmates as equals in the circle, equally vulnerable in truths shared. By practicing deep and respectful listening, not putting ourselves or one another down, or projecting unfavorably onto one another, we mirror what is strong and true within each of us. In this way, many women experience the validation of their own words and insights, many for the first time. Here we model what research suggests, that expressive, creative activity boosts self-esteem and wellness, pushing self-awareness into new territory. In addition to helping women find their voice, we regularly gather and share their stories beyond the circle. The book, Hear Me, See Me, was invited as an outgrowth of the blog of their writings. You will experience straight from the pen responses to prompts written in 15 to 20 minutes, entirely unedited. These powerful experiences from survivors of every kind of trauma, abuse, and addiction offer the rest of us deep insight and inspiration. A lifeline for many of these women, writing provides an opportunity to come to terms with choices and circumstances that led them to prison in the first place, and hopefully one that continues to remind them how they want to live differently going forward. As you listen, please hold compassion in your hearts for these women returning through this reading to a difficult past, time, and place. Today we will use some of our core practices as outlined in your program. Each reader will say her name and read one selection, followed by a single chime while her words filter and settle. You do it louder, you'll use your right hand. <laughs> um, a second chime will signal the next reader to say her name and read her selection, and so on for two rounds of readings. We ask that you hold silence for their words to resonate and your ears to take them in. Following the final chime, we will invite you to share lines or phrases that have struck you while listening. Paper and pen are at your places for this purpose. After sharing these readback lines, a final chime will signal the end of our reading. A Q&A will be followed by an opportunity to purchase and have your book signed at the table behind the books. If so moved, you are also invited to share on an index card what is stirring in you as a result of today's reading. Please place those anonymous responses into the basket up here. Listening can be hard work. If you need to stretch or step away for a moment, we ask that you do so between readers to help maintain the reverence for our space. And thank you so much for joining us here today.
I'm reading for Josephine. Lost in the dark. A mother lost in the dark, trying so hard to grow, and yet holding on to her child. A child trying so hard to reach for the light of hope and faith to understand. The child sprouts wings to fly upon the light. The mother looks away into the growing darkness. The child is torn between her love for her mother and the light that offers help, a future. Shall she remain in the dark with a mother who lives with such cold, dark emptiness? Or go into the light, become motherless and alone, but in such a better place? Hi, I'm Elena, and the piece I'm reading for you is called Life Inside. Caged like animals at the zoo, being watched on display, the guards know all that we do, all through the night and day. Sometimes it feels almost as though we're here for their amusement, creatures milling to and fro. None of us are heaven sent. They watch us sleep. They hear us roar. Just our thoughts they can't keep. And life isn't what it was before. We have to watch what we say. Be careful what we do. There are times when we play. But usually we're feeling blue. We make a friend. We socialize. But in the end... No one hears us cry. We're in a crowd, but so all alone. Sometimes we get loud <laughs> when we bitch and moan. We eat bad food, take their medication. We sit and brood, wishing for probation. We aspire to greatness, but we fall just short. We often get, give much less when we're out of sorts. We live on what we're given, but it's not very much. And it's not really living when you use others as a crutch. We're left with just our souls, which can truly fly free. We all have our goals. We all have our dreams. Hi, I'm Angie, and I'll be reading Overnight Grown Up. I cut my sister's Barbie's doll's hair and put her toy china in the Easy Bake Oven. The homemade Play-Doh mom made tasted better than the stuff we bought at Ames. Those big fat crayons they gave us at first didn't break as easy as the thin ones when you smash them with three fingers. My mother had a box of dress-up clothes and would ask me who I was, and had I seen her daughter. I'd cry every time and scream, It's me, Mommy. Don't you know it's me? When I grew up the next day, I was mad. I became the mom. I became the wife. I became the hired hand. I no longer wanted anyone to know. I always had to put on a show. I ran a bit away, but wouldn't go far, except the time me and a friend stole her parents' car. I liked to read and did so with greed, and found it would give me a way to get everything I'd need. I'm 42, but don't know the same life as you. But when you talk, I can share a story most believe isn't true. I've been through it all, but wished I had not. I wish I'd planned my life with a little more thought. Uh, 
I am Michelle. I'm reading today, My Many Layers. Like an onion, my life has many layers. The innermost layers, tender and green, like my infancy and childhood. Not completely even all the way around, as I am just learning about things then. The next layer, innocent, but getting larger, so filled with juice and thick, the meat of the onion. The further layers getting thinner as the years seem to fly by until by, by an, sorry, fly by until I am a wife, no longer just someone's child. And then I become a mother as well. And now my children have grown and don't physically need me anymore. The layer is even thinner. And eventually my skin will wrinkle and age like an onion, skin brown and fragile to the touch until I too am buried under the ground like an onion root that grows new life to the next generation of onion. Hi, my name is Tess. Good morning. Thank you. I'm reading, I am here. God is an ocean of mercy. Collapse into God's arms and you'll weep like a child. Rumi. It is me, your daughter. I am here in your life. Your grace has given me many blessings. It is me whom you loved, no matter the number of my faults. I am here broken be before you, ready to receive your glory. Tess, it is me, your daughter. I am here in your light. Your grace has given me many blessings. It is me whom you loved, no matter the number of my faults. I am here broken before you ready to receive your glory. I have taken many paths in this life which have taught me not to fear you, for you gave me breath, you gave me life. And through these many circumstances, you let me live. I am of love and have been forgiven. Please show me what it is you want from me. I am at your mercy. I am on bended knee asking for you to hold me, comfort me, show me how to control my fear of the world. Give me the strength, the power to rise from the bondage of my addiction. Clear my path of suffering and give me your love. I am right here, ready to receive it, live in it, breathe it and give it back to the world. Nora Jean, those of us who survive here by reading scars, finding faults, before they open up and swallow us, talk gingerly. We learned early to whisper, tiptoe, skirt our way around. We live by losing, love by letting go, enduring the random uprooting. We drown in downpours. Because we find ourselves so often unable to speak, endings without stories, scattered notes instead of songs. What will it take? Will my children tell whole stories? Will they dance? 
Will they be able to push down beyond the scars and faults? Oh, how I pray they be filled with a sense of their own belonging, to be fruit undamaged. I'm reading for Stacy. Remaining silent. Silence is not guilty versus guilty. Silence means no one knows the truth. I never chose this life of silence. I was forced into it. The system that should have been my voice forced me speechless. They were silent when they placed my life in danger. Out of anger, I've remained silent. I never say what really happened. At one point, I would have argued the power of silence. Now, I only wish to speak out, to cry out, to tell everything. Hi, Elena. The reminder, a reminder to the woman I may become. First of all, stop screwing up. But don't be so hard on yourself if you do. You're only a mere human and we all have flaws and missteps. We are all imperfect and make mistakes, some of epic proportions. I'd like to remind you also, Elena, to give love <clears throat> as freely as your children, for they are the very best of you. Take all advice offered with a large grain of salt. Even well-meant well advice can bite you in the well-endowed behind. Don't be so serious. Life has its good days, and don't be afraid to revel in them. Laugh when others do. Yep, even when they're laughing at you. You must admit you have done some world-class crazy shit, girlfriend. May I remind you also that brutal honesty is not always a plus. Sometimes a simple, it's a pretty dress, will suffice when your best friend asks you how her size 20 frame looks in a size 12 gown. A polite reminder also to be the daughter your mom expected. It's never too late to change. Not radically, just try to be softer. You don't have to beat people over the head with a bat to get their attention. Be kind to animals. Many of them have treated you better than some humans, even the ones that bit and scratched you. Don't wear your negativity like a badge of honor. It will get you nowhere. <clears throat> Lastly, be your own role model. Live a, <clears throat> sorry. Live a good life, and you will have only yourself to thank in the end. Hey, I'm Angie, and I'm going to read Seamus. She was just 15 and knew what she wanted to do. That she is me. I knew I wanted to teach young children. I had worked at this daycare for two summers now, and once a week, and vacations during the school year. I loved my job working as the one-to-one -one aide with Seamus. He was a wonderful little boy to work with. He had autism 
and the teachers didn't really like working with him a lot. They tried to treat him like a baby, even though he was five. They made him be in the two-year-old classroom because of his special needs. They put him in diapers and wouldn't let him play with the others for fear he'd hit them or something worse. I tried to include him whenever I could get away with it. He never hit me, and he never hit any of the other children. The teachers that weren't the best and would yell or be rough got hit a lot. With me, he'd smile and sometimes squeal out something like, dur, 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 dur. He couldn't speak other than stuff like that, but I could tell what he wanted. When we went for walks, they put him in a baby carriage. I hated that, and so did he. I was so glad when I went to a different daycare to work, and surprisingly, his parents moved him there too. This daycare was more into including all kids. He got to be in the four to six year old class. He worked on potty training and no more baby carriage. He walked on the rope the same as the others. He was encouraged to do his best in whatever other children did. He wasn't treated like a baby anymore, and I was so glad to see how much he grew. He was doing everything I knew he could do, and even though he needed a little more help than the others, I knew he was happy. I miss him so much. I'm Michelle. I'm reading Chaos Came Calling. The guest that visited me today was Chaos. My usual schedule was disrupted. I had no work crew today, so I skipped breakfast and slept in. I got up for lunch, and as soon as I came back to the unit from lunch, he was here. Chaos, I mean. He whispered in my ear in the bathroom and then called me to the officer's desk and told me I would be moving to another room. Chaos knows that loud things are my trigger and loud arguments can send me scurrying under my bed, covering my ears and humming to cover it up. Chaos gave me the opportunity to do just that. I, however, being grown up on the outside at least, just sat on the bed and plugged my ears. After the loudness and the arguments were over, I stayed in my room. I'm afraid I was not a good hostess for chaos. I didn't offer him a drink or ask him to sit and stay. Chaos is a guest I really don't care for. I wish chaos would never visit or that I knew how better to deal with chaos as a visitor. Maybe there's a class. Hi, I'm Tess. Holding on, letting go. My past has shadowed my heart. My moon dipped so low that when night broke, it left a trail behind so dark that it kept me far away from what was right. In letting go of the past abuse, the things that left me feeling I didn't belong in my world, I'm letting go of the pain and hurt the men who told me I would always be falling short of my dreams. I'm letting go of the possibility that I may not live through another relapse. I'm holding on to life, the chance to challenge myself to live and become what I couldn't, because I now can. I'm holding on to the memories that keep me moving forward, knowing I left my imprint on some on so many hearts, I'm holding on to every last encouraging word another speaks to me. I'm holding on because tomorrow is never promised. Thank you, 
DG. I'm scared, actually terrified. This way of life has molded me. This is who I am. No dreams, no ambitions, no motivation, no responsibility. How easy my life goes by. My other love, my first love, the one I gave away, her nose up to the window, watching me drive away, crying for me, the only one that can comfort her, and I still drive away. So at this point, um, we'd like to take just a moment to uh, transition um, our speakers and open the floor to sharing lines that might have resonated with you. Um, I think we have, what, some mics around the room. So um, the, the trick to doing readback lines is to uh, say them slowly and loudly and to leave a little space between you and the next person. Believe it or not, we're not uh, in a race, so we can take our time and let the words hang in the air. say what really happened. God is an ocean of mercy. Be kind to animals. <laughs> Will my children tell whole stories? for me to understand. I rather embrace English written. This I can much better to understand. When I grew up the next day. Reading scars. No matter the number of my faults, mom won't fire me. Seamus, he was doing everything I knew he could do. I am here. This way of life has I pray for a sense of my children. I pray for my children's sense of their own belonging. Mm -hmm. Receive it and give it back to the world. It's me, Mommy. Mm -hmm. Covering my ears and humming. Uh, my innermost layer is tender and creamy. Try to be softer. We all have dreams. 
onion, onion root grows new life. Tomorrow is never promised. Der, 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 do. <laughs> I wish I had planned my life with you know, little and more thought. <coughs> Even well endowed advice will bite you from behind. <laughs> Silence means no one knows the truth. Maybe there's a class? <laughs> Live on what we're given. And then I become a mother myself. I still drive away. Wish I'd planned life with a little more thought. I think we'll transition now and um, give these amazing women a huge round of applause. One of the things um, that um, I, we may have mentioned, we may not have, but all of these pieces were written um, on a first write. None of them have been edited. So this is all literally coming out of the women as they wrote them. So it's extraordinary when you take that into consideration as someone who writes. Um, we would like to open it up for question and answer, comments. Um, the women are willing to um, answer questions. Um, we'll do that for a few minutes. Um, and then we would, um, the women will also be available to sign books for you. Um, we have Phoenix here to um, sell to you. And um, the women really enjoy signing books. So don't miss that opportunity. Um, question. Oh yeah, and the artwork that's um, punctuated our space here is all artwork that the women created while they were inside as part of the Writing Inside program. So we had some visiting artists come in and, um, and, and do some um, artwork with the women. So that's all what you see here along kind of the whole perimeter here. So question, yes. Yeah. I feel so cozy being with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sarah and I have written together as part of Sarah's Women Writing for a Change program, and we started, and you can chime in too, we started um, talking about this and really wanting to bring this supportive, structured, safe, space for writing um, to incarcerated women. So we started our brainstorming process, we talked to corrections, and um, we eventually um, started the program in St. Albans up at Northwest Correctional where the women were initially, um, actually they've moved quite a lot in the last 10 years. They've moved to four different facilities in the state of Vermont. So they were moved um, to Chittenden about three years ago, and so we took the program with us. We actually, when that move happened, we were the very first program to begin operating inside the Women's Correctional Facility in South Burlington because so many of the other programs had very big logistics for things they had to move, programs that involved a lot of um, equipment or supplies, and we had our pens and paper, so we started literally a week after they were there, and we've continued weekly um, ever since. 
I was a participant in one of Sarah's very early women writing for a change classes, and it was hard enough to feel safe enough to write in a group of women. How, though, did you ever feel safe enough to bear your souls as you did with your writing and as you have today? I really admire your courage, but wonder how you did it. Anyone who can answer. I don't open up that easily to new people. Um, but there was something about walking into that group and seeing Sarah. She had the kindest spirit, the, the nicest aura about her, and, and Mary Beth and Meg, all of them, and we have another one, Jules, who couldn't be here today. Um, all of these ladies proved that they were so non judgmental and that they just truly love to write for the sake of the word. And I somehow just knew that it was a safe place. And the other writers are also very non-judgmental women. We don't, um, we don't feel that anyone is better than anyone else. We all think we're of equal value. And it's just so good to know that you're not alone. So I think that's how I felt safe. I can't speak for them, but that was my experience. The whole process of the sacred circle and, and the rules of not interrupting and not, not uh, critiquing everyone else's work um, makes you feel safer to <coughs> tell everybody what you're feeling and what you said to them. And the fact that everybody else is telling what they're feeling and what they've said. So there's a camaraderie there as well. <clears throat> I just have been wondering if your writing has um, been a vehicle for you to be able to communicate with people in your family, um, children, partners, parents. Tessie. I, uh, for me, my writing has been an outlet for me. Um, with my family, with my children. Um, it was a way t uh, for me to release what was inside me. Um, I'm a really emotional person, so I'll cry very easily. So for me, grabbing a pen and a piece of paper is just really easy, and then sharing it. It's, it comes, you know, it comes easy. Yeah. Yeah. This is a big, big, big change. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 No, this is on her aunt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is her grandma. Any of the other women want to chime in on that one?
one of the things that Sarah and I felt really strongly about was creating a blog so that the women's writings would anonymously be put out to the wider world as a way to really change perceptions about who incarcerated women are. Um, and so we have had numerous examples of family members um, emailing us and saying, wow, I'm really seeing the changes in my, my daughter, my sister, my brother, um, you know, through their writing. So it's been an amazing, we've had a couple of family reconnections as a result, family members who had kind of written off their kin and have reconnected because they read the writing and were moved by it and, and felt and saw the change. Yes, writinginsidevt.com. Yes. Another question, comment? Yeah. Uh, me and Joanna, I moved to Vermont from Maine. I wrote this book, uh, The Rock Stars ABC Book of Meditation and Memories. Uh, it was published by um, Turnkey Press, self published. And unfortunately, the publisher has gone out of business. It's still available on Amazon. Yes more valuable because um, there's fewer than around. But what, this is the copy I gave my son. What it does is um, I've written down quotes. It came about as a job loss. And as I say here, so it's an inspirational book that offers self-help without being preachy. And to write out your thoughts and to you know, do writing. Every day I was a journal writer my whole life. And to encourage writing or artwork. My dad did all the artwork in the book. Great. And I'm uh, also doing a nonprofit organization called Action Based Care where the philosophy is to do an action based activity to to get up your anger and your depression. Great. Thank you very much. Another question or comment for the women? Yes. I heard that a couple of people were here. Sarah, you want to answer that? A question about the size of the group and whether women just write in the group or outside of the group. So there are actually two different groups now. When you go inside, you're just in for many minutes every week. Louder. And so the writing that is done there is the writing that you occur here. And it's not changed in any way. It's, it's just done on the spot. And the group size, and range, I mean, it depends on a lot of things. You know, things happen inside. You get lockdowns, you get quarantines, you get um, people being tired or in a bad mood. So there can be, you know, zero to, I think the biggest group we probably have is around 20. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say that the sort of core group only two weeks is about six to 10. Um, but it's not unusual to have a run of three to five and then a run of 12. Um, the group that we have now started on the outside um, is about six. And that group is run more like my traditional uh, women writing groups. And they are expected to write in between. That is the point of that group. The point of that group is, in fact, to polish some writing that not, whether it's a collection or a single piece that might want to submit. But for them to have that experience of working through um, the writing group, so that it's moving yeah. from just an immediate expression to something that we are focusing on practice. Yes. I'd right. like to really say that I'm so appreciated for you being <coughs> to help women that really need help and make a difference. Thank you to you for what you do. That give them back to their families. Give them, give them back to us. I'm all about family, mm -hmm. and I, I love my family, and I want my family. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sarah and I would often say that we, we got more out of the group than the women. I mean, truly, it's, it's an incredible thing to walk into a space where you are in a trusting place, and Sarah and I write vulnerably as well about our lives and our struggles with self-esteem and everything. So it's an amazing 
thing to be in a space where you can be really honest about what you're grappling with in your life. And in, in some cases, this group is a place to be more honest than anywhere else in my life. So it, it's really a blessing for us as well. But thank you. Yes, question in the back. Oh, say that a little louder. Yeah, the class is typically, um, or the gathering is about 90 minutes. Um, and it's each, each writing session is structured, has a theme. Um, we usually use a uh, piece of poetry as a jumping off point. Do you want to add anything, Sarah? Well, I remembered what I was saying. Oh, okay, good, good, good. The reason we say these agreements is to keep the circle safe and to keep it from sliding into therapy or, or sliding into sort of confessional time. You know, it's really important that the writing is the focus and even though the process of writing can be very therapeutic, as everyone has attested, it's helped them grow, it's helped them re-examine their choices, that's the point. Um, but, but the purpose of these agreements is to keep a structure in place so that it doesn't become a scary place and that we don't send them back to their, to their cells somehow open and, and, and bleedage. You know, we, we're very careful to close it up again. And uh, that's, so that I just wanted to be very responsible. <laughs> yeah. There was a young woman, yeah. Yeah, good question. So any of the women want to chime in on that? Skeptical at first and kind of tested the process through. Well, for me personally, I, I'm always skeptical of people I don't know. <laughs> Just my lovely, untrusting nature, I guess. Um, you know, if I go to a restaurant, I sit with my wall against my, my back against the wall because I'm afraid the waitress is going to stab me with a steak knife or something. You know, so that's, I'm always skeptical. But um, I've got to say that after that first class, I knew, you know, reading the, the circle agreements and being non judgmental and seeing these women smile and cry and just 
accents, but it's, and just being so free with their words, you know, it amazed me. And I thought, well, how oh, they can do it, I can do it. You know, but I've been writing since I was 14, and I'm now not 14, um, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> um, so I, having been somewhat of a writer for so many years, skepticism in writing was not a factor. It was my skepticism. with anybody outside my media family. But it's it's a, 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 a great uh, experience to have, even to have been in jail, I feel very blessed. I learned a lot about life, about people, about me, <coughs> about writing and these ladies. And um, it, it really was a very positive thing in my life. So I think most of these ladies would agree that this, this group was a true blessing in their life. And just thank you to everybody. One of, one of the women who was going to read with us today, um, but we had a miscommunication with her parole officer, was a beautiful example. She would never in her wildest dreams have thought to come to a writing group. But there was a woman who had come, who was now her roommate, who said, I think you really like this group. And she had actually been in prison with us before. It wasn't until about two years ago that she stuck her feet in, and she has not left the circle. Um, she'll be writing with us on the outside now that she's out, but she, I mean, it just became her lifeline. You could see the growth in her own uh, self from those early writings to now. So she would have been the perfect person to answer that mm, question. Mm. There are so few um, non-judgmental spaces in our world, you know, so this, I think that's what I hear always over and over from the women is what they deeply appreciate is the lack of judgment, the, the welcoming of all voices, really, really important. Yes? Well, I'm glad you made that statement. Am I correct in assuming this is in no way an English class? I mean, even in high school, teaching English, it was an issue of uh, you know, hurting somebody's feelings. So nothing is correct. Nothing is corrected with one exception. We did have um, a writer who, whose uh, spelling was very inventive. And in order to include her, some of her pieces in the book, we did take the liberty of uh, making it recognizable. Because out of context, uh, some of her writing would make sense with the, the spelling. She, she also suffered from dyslexia. So she everything was phonetically spelled, so um, she would write on the bottom of her paper, please spell check for me. You know, like she had a sense of pride, like I want people to understand this and hear my voice, so we would help her out in that regard. One or two more questions, yeah, or comments. Not a question, but I've, I've been to a writing group that happens with mentor and I'm so impressed with um, the listening that goes on, and I think that is, um, Modeled in the group, people listen to what it is, and that's an often happening in real life. Just so there, that's a learning that's going on. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. For a time, there was a mentor-mentee writing group. Is it still happening? Okay, great. It's still happening inside. So mentors um, who mentor through Vermont Works for Women and Mercy Connections um, incarcerated women inside as they transition out right with their mentees um, on the inside. So that's a wonderful way for mentors and mentees to really form a relationship and get to know each other at a deeper level through the writing process. So thank you for coming today.